You're ready. So are we. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm Dr. Marsha Bradden. I'm Dr. Pat Edwards. And we're with Brony Study. And we have an announce. And we have an announcement for you. Uh, we're happy to report that we have a contract for the Brony Book with McFarland Press, and so we are in the process of writing the long-awaited book. We're hoping to have it available for next year's BronyCon. And, so, and, and we, really, we really want to thank, uh, because this wouldn't be possible without the 60,000 plus Bronies who have uh, come forward and helped us with our surveys and that. And I hope you'll continue to help us because we're not done with our study. But. Um. We are, you know, as you know, in the process of a longitudinal study. Uh, some of our uh, brony gentlemen are handing out some papers that go take you directly to a survey that is just for people who have attended the con. And it's not a very long survey, not like some of them we've put out, and we know it, but uh, we'd like for you all to go and go online, take the survey, just for the people who have gone to the con. The other thing is that if you go to our website, there's a meetup survey that we'd like for you all to take, and that's going to be up for probably, what, another month? Be pro up for probably another month, but we'd appreciate if you go and take that. When we've got 700, we'd like to double that number before we close it out. So <coughs> please go take that survey also. And, and on that survey, we, we're looking for people who have gone to meetups, who haven't gone to meetups, and who went and didn't go back. So basically everybody. Yeah. Uh, but we're looking at um, what are the yeah. factors that influence people's attendance to meetups or, or not. But today we're going to talk about um, a question that is very frequently asked. If you all remember, uh, I'm the one that, that does all the emailing. And uh, one of the questions that's most often asked is, is the fandom changing? Some people feel like it's changing for the better. Some people feel like it's, cha it's not changing at all. Some people feel like it's changing for the worse. It's growing bigger. It's growing smaller. We get all kinds of opinions. But the question is, is the fandom changing? And so today we're going to present those oh, results. I, you always have to have derpy at the beginning of any presentation. Yeah. Uh, but at the top is the, the survey, the little slip that's being handed out. And then if you want to do the meetup survey, go to bronystudy.com and that will direct you the, uh, to it. So. Also, real quickly, uh, do we have any of the brony <coughs> admins in here? Meetup admins? A couple of you? Okay. As soon as this is over with, I'm going to have a little meeting down in room 348. If you can follow me, I want to give you some of the preliminary results from the earlier group. Uh, and there's some interesting results. So that's for the, the admins that are here. The other thing is that we are doing the book. We are going to be putting some pictures in it. But because of uh, McVarlin and uh, uh, copyrights and property rights, we do have to get a release. If you would like your picture taken to be in the book, and I can't promise it will be there, but if you don't sign the release, I can promise it won't. Um, but if you'll meet me over, over outside of that door, sign the release, we'll take your picture, and maybe you'll be published. Okay, we're going to do some uh, frequently asked questions and the assumptions. Oh. Oh, the bar. Okay. And the first assumption is process. And we have, we all know as psychologists that the only thing that does not change is the fact that everything changes. Think about your life. Everything changes. The second one is that all social groups, be they fandoms, churches, families, change over time and are in a constant state of flux. Think about your family. It cannot stay the same as when you were a baby. Why? You grew up. 
So it's got to change. The third assumption is that losing members is not always a bad thing. And gaining new members and growing is not always a good thing. And then the last one is that most as uh, assessments are simply snapshots and they tell us about how things are changing but don't necessarily tell us why. There are two types of uh, Brony research designs uh, that are used in investigation and in Brony study we've used both of them. The first one is the cross-sectional uh, method. And in the cross-sectional method, we're going to assess at one particular time cr a cross-section of the different populations. For instance, we may, uh, we may assess the uh, 15 to 18 group, and then the 18 to 21, the 21 to 25, and then the 25 to say 28 or 30. That is a cross section. We get a sampling from each one of those groups. Uh, but it's at one point in time, and it's divided into groups. <clears throat> Could be the length of time in the family. The second thing, uh, okay, on the cross sectional survey, we have a preseason survey five, and the number is 3,340 who took the survey. On a longitudinal survey, you're uh, going to be sampling or getting uh, responses from the same people over time. And if you took the first cross-sectional survey, you noted that we asked you to create a code by which we could code your data. So it's sampling the same people multiple times. The longitudinal survey has been going on since uh, 2012, and at the present time, the, uh, the number that have taken every one of those surveys, and bless you darlings, is 222. Now that doesn't mean that there's only 222 on each survey. That's 222 that have taken every single survey. Okay, what I'm going to do now is um, talk a little bit because as Marcia said, we, we did both types of, of research methods and when you do, this is called developmental research, how do we change across time? Each of these methods have some advantages for example, cross-situational, it's easy because I go in and get 3,000 people and then I divide them up uh, versus the longitudinal where I have to get a group of people and follow them. And trust me, it's not easy to follow people because, in fact, one of the reasons our numbers are a little low to an, is that um, I think a lot of people don't check their emails. So we would send out emails to everybody and say, okay, follow-up two's ready. And we would get a lot of people not respond. And I think uh, the, the problem with developmental is, or with longitudinal is how do you keep in touch with people? And uh, in the future, when we do this, we might look at other possible ways of keeping in touch with people besides just an email. But I'm gonna talk first about the cross-sectional and the data that that gave us, and then we'll talk about the longitudinal. So we're really talking about two studies that we've done here. All right, first, with the cross-sectional approach, um, as we mentioned, there were 3,340. 3, the mean age was about 21.7, which if you were here when Coder Brony did the, the herd census data a little earlier, uh, this is running right around what he found, 21 to 22 years of age. It was collected between February and April of this year, so we squeezed it in right before season five started. And we advertised on Equestria Daily. That's the primary site, plus I usually advertise on some of the Facebook brony groups and that. Um, the three things we did and that we're using in this study is we asked, we asked each subject to indicate which season they became a brony. So was it season one during the summer, season two? And you'll see that that's, um, 
pretty important and we'll come back to that in a minute also we asked them about their interests how has your interest changed on a one to five scale has it decreased greatly slightly has it increased uh, greatly or slightly uh, so how has it changed and then also we're going to talk about and I know sometimes people will sort of say what is it with this brony type you keep talking about um, and I think you're going to see by the time we finish this discussion uh, the importance of the brony type. Not all bronies are the same, but figuring out how they're different is a challenge. We think we figured it out, and I think you'll see it helps us explain also how the fandom is changing. So the, the data, the graphs. And this uh, lo it looks at how fan interest and involvement. So we ask people, how has your interest in the Brony fandom and your involvement with the fandom changed over the last three months? And where it says seasons, this is the, the group of people who, who became members in season one, the group who became members in season two. So this is where we took everybody and we broke them into groups and that. What we see is any number over three, a three basically means stayed the same. So anything above three means there's growth, that there's an increase in interest. And so when you look across this, what you see is that in season one and two, those people who were the early bronies, there's a slight increase in interest. Not a lot, but a slight increase. So in other words, we'd say, well, they're not, it's not below three. But as you see, the newer bronies, those that joined in season three and four, there's a, a considerable increase. Uh, in fact, a four is slightly to, to a great increase. So the newer bronies from this tells us are gaining interest and involvement. This is not surprising because almost with any group, a church group, a, a, a sports group, the new people are usually the most emphatic. The converts are the ones who usually have the greatest degree of interest. Uh, so this would tend to tell us that interest uh, is growing. Another way to look at this is I went in and looked at those people who said there was an increase in their interest and those people who said there was a decrease. And again, what we see is season one and season two, the older bronies, 30% of them are saying there's an increase, around 22% decrease, but look at season four. 70% of the newer bronies are experiencing stronger growth and interest in that. Uh, this means as long as we have new people coming in, that interest is probably going to tend uh, to grow. Um, now, let me real quickly, I mentioned the issue about the brony types. And I want to review real quickly, because the question when you create a typology is what do you base it on? And our typology is based on something we saw in our very first survey with the Bronies, way back in 2011. And that was when we went in and looked at the data, it seemed that there were two dimensions that the Bronies would differ on. In other words, some Bronies would be real high on it, others would be low. Those two dimensions were the one across the top is what we call purpose or meaning uh, fan pattern. This means people high in it are people who say, I find a lot of purpose, meaning, guidance from being a fan. Some of them might even go so far as to say WWPD. What would a pony do? In other words, these are people who, who, who being a fan gives them a purpose and meaning. And they may even go and look for answers to questions there. People low on that are saying like, no. You know, maybe they're there because they like the humor. Maybe they like the cartoon. But they're not finding any uh, guidance. So you see high, medium, and low. On the other side, the other dimension had to do with people's ability to disclose. In fact, I'd venture to say most of you here in looking at our, at our type are probably a good mixture of social uh, and mixed bronies because social bronies in particular are more than happy to tell you they're a brony, they wear the t-shirts, they, they're very open about it. Secret bronies, and there probably are some here, although I remember the first brony con, I asked the question, are there people here where your parents and friends think you're somewhere else? And if the answer is yes, then that means you may be a secret brony, in that you can't tell a lot of people, but you're very much committed to it. So when you, you see this creates a, a, a five brony types, the social bronies are high in purpose and meaning, but they're also high on social disclosure. 
they're happy to tell people, I'm a brony. The secret bronies are high in meaning and purpose. They're, they're committed, but they often can't tell people. So they may keep it hidden from their friends. They may keep it hidden from their family. The hipster bronies are high in social disclosure. Oh, they're more than happy to tell you they're a brony. But they don't find guidance and purpose. And what we're going to see is there's a real clear pattern with the hipsters. They're the group that's been around the longest. They're also the group that tends to be leaving. But things, as fandoms change, often that's part of what happened. The mix kind of fall in between. These are bronies who are committed to the fandom. They may tell their friends, but not their parents. They may tell their parents, but not the people at school. So they're kind of really mixed. They're in between. And the hidden bronies are the ones who often we ask ourselves, what are they getting out of the fandom? But it appears these are the ones who like the cartoon. They like the humor. But they don't care about being social, and they don't want anybody to know they're a brony. And they're, the percentages tell you about how many people meet each group. So the biggest groups are social, secret, and mixed, which about a third each. And the hipsters and the hiddens are much smaller. So most of you here probably fall into that social, secret, and mixed groups. In that. Also, that's part of what that survey we're asking you to take will tell us. In that. Um, now, one, and I know this looks a little busy, but there's some really important information here. This asks by season what types of bronies we have. So this means that in season one, those people who were the joined early tend to be high in mixed bronies, reasonably high in social, but high in hipsters. In fact, about 22% of those original bronies would be classified as hipster bronies. And then as you go along, season two, what you notice is mix and hipsters, the percentages drop. Now this doesn't mean that the people in the first season are changing. No, this means the people who joined in season two make up a different mixture. But look as we go to the new bronies in three and then particularly the new bronies in season four. What this is telling us is the bronies that are joining now, the, the new season four and season five bronies, are largely social bronies they're also a good many mixed. And look at the secret. It went from being around, I think it was about 14, 13, 14 percent among the original bronies. It's now jumped up to almost 30 percent. Now you might say, why is that? I think it's because the fandom is maturing and it's also becoming safer and safer. And so people feel like, I can be a secret brony. It's okay to be a brony and I don't necessarily need to tell anybody. Maybe because if people find out, it won't be that big of a deal anymore. So this is telling us that there's a very important change taking place. Not that bronies are changing, but the people who are being attracted to the fandom represent different type of brony. One last thing, I, uh, well, actually, there's two more points. One is, what about the bronies and interest? You know, we talked about these different types. What this is showing is interest and involvement. Notice the social secret and mixed bronies, they're all above three, which means those three groups are gaining an interest. The hipsters and the hiddens are losing an interest in that. So uh, also note that the, the newer bronies make up that first three groups. So this would again tend to point out that the newer bronies coming in uh, are really, really interested and have a lot of, uh, of involvement. Now, one last, and then we'll conclude with this, uh, this piece and go on to the longitudinal. But one thing we did is we, because we're not able to tell whether we're gaining bronies or losing bronies in general, we asked the bronies from their own experience, if they could, to judge whether the fandom is gaining or losing members in these three age groups, 14 and below, 15 and 20, 21 above. What this shows is that, by and large, the bronies see the fandom as growing, particularly the 15 to 20 year old group. So what this is saying is the bronies' perception is we're gaining more members. But notice there's also a sizable increase in below 14 and even the 21 age group there's still new bronies coming in, at least that's the perception, although there is somewhat higher perception of decline. In other words, of the three groups, the feeling is we may be losing some of those older uh, bronies. 
So what about, what can we conclude from this? Well, the first thing that we conclude is that the newer fans report a stronger growing interest. They're, uh, they're the new converts, they're the new people who have just become involved in it, and let's face it, as the Brony fandom has, has grown older in age, the other thing that's happened is that more people know about it, and so it's kind of become um, okay to be, to be a Brony now. The second thing is on the average, all Bronies are reporting that they stayed the same or slight increases in interest. Uh, not getting the, the two groups that are declining in interest, and remember I said that one of the assumptions in the beginning is that losing members is not always bad. It was the, uh, the two that are the least, uh, that are doing the least with guidance, one of them that was doing the social, and we think that those are the Rule 34 group. But um, <clears throat> what can I tell you from that? Um, the, uh, the type of brony matters when you're looking at who is losing interest. And we have caught a lot of flack from, about categories, categorizing people by group, but we have found that from a scientific point of view, it's something which has been ad advantageous. And the type of brony does matter when you're taking a look at increases and decreases in interest and involvement. Uh, the fandom is changing partly because new fans tend to be more social, more mixed, and more secret. The hidden bronies, it's no longer has any shock value, so they're hitting the road. And the, um, the hidden bronies are not getting a lot of guidance from it, they're not getting a lot of socialization from it, and so there's not really a lot to keep them involved. Um, and the other thing is that it's, it is the perception of a large majority of the fans that they are gaining new members, especially in the older group and the younger group, the middle age group, um, they see it, but not as much. And I, I'd like to mention, I think one of the things in these last uh, two points, um, one way to think about it is this, people are discovering the fandom, new people are coming in, but they're not coming into it the route many, many of the real early bronies did. They're not discovering it on 4chan, which <laughs> if you know the history, the fandom started on 4chan. It's left 4chan. I know it's still there. People will say, oh, they still have art and that. But most of the new fans are not discovering. They're coming to it because of love and tolerance. They're coming to it because of the brony documentaries that uh, I've heard some people say are propaganda. Well, yeah, but it's good propaganda. Uh, you know, so that's where they're coming from. And that's also one of the ways in which the fandom is changing. You know, you, you hate to lose anybody, but to a certain degree, and I had one um, hipster brony once kind of tell me, you know, don't these new bronies get it? It's all a joke. And I'm like, no, don't no, you get it. It's, it's no longer a joke. A joke. Love and tolerance is what the fandom's about now. So that's a big part of those changes. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk now about the second analysis, the longitudinal analysis. Um, well, excuse me, we know we're burying you in data today, but uh, you all, most of you all took our surveys and we feel like we need to give you these results. Yeah. You, know, you, we, you need to hear these results. If you're going to do us the favor of, of uh, taking the survey, then we're going to do you the favor of get, telling you what, you what the results are. Well, also, okay. Also, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, because we talked about this, and I said, well, I think one reason, uh, another good reason to give you all of this information is it's a reminder. And when you talk to people, and some people will kind of sort of, ah, the bronies, but, is to say, no, there is research. There are statistics. We have numbers. We have 60,000 subjects. We have... You know, this, this, in a sense, supports what I think a lot of you know about the fandom. 
and what do you, a lot of you wish you could express to people who don't understand the fandom and that. So I think this is important for you as, as fans and as a fandom to realize you're not standing alone. You're not just speaking from your own personal experience. Yeah. You know, our surveys and data support. I, um, I often, when people ask me, because I'm retired from uh, my profession, uh, and now I'm doing more in my profession, uh, but when people ask me what I'm doing and I tell them I'm, I'm researching bronies, uh, a lot, I have had a lot of people to say, oh yeah, that's a bunch of pedophiles, or uh, oh yeah, that's fighting words. Or, oh yeah, those are the people that write that nasty fiction. And the first question out of my mouth is, show me your data. Well, they haven't got data, but I've got data. <laughs> so. Right then and there, they're sunk. <laughs> so if the, anybody comes to you with that question or with some comment like that, tell them. Show me your data. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the longitudinal analysis real quick. Uh, again, the numbers were 222. We actually have a lot more people, and we will continue to do this, so some of you in here may in fact take part in the the post-season five uh, follow-up in that. Uh, we're going to keep collecting data. We're adding more. But the 222 people took all four uh, analysis. And again, I think the, in, the using emails was a little bit of a problem because some people did three of the four, some people did two of the four. We're only including, we will use your data, those others, but we're only including those who took all four assessment here. Um, and again, uh, we asked for email, only about 75% gave us an email address, so right there, 25%, we could uh, contact in that. But, um, and we sent emails, uh, I also made an announcement on Equestria Daily, letting people know that it was there and that, and we'll continue to do that, I'll send out emails. You can still, if you haven't taken part, you can still go on to bronystudy.com and do the longitudinal survey the, the initial analysis, and then we'll add your data uh, as we go along. Because uh, we are using it, we're just not using it in that 222. Right. Um, they, so again, only subjects who completed all three surveys. Now, when we looked at the typology, there's an interesting breakdown, and I'll, I'll mention in a moment why this is important. Of those 222, about 18% were social bronies, that's quite a bit lower than the 30% we mentioned. Secret made up 13, Mixed made up 34, Hipsters made up 25.7, and the Hidden Bronies made up 8.1. If you remember back to the earlier slide, the, the, newer, the older Bronies, the first season Bronies, looked a lot like this. There were a lot of Mixed, a lot of Hipsters. So these bronies look like our older bronies, which would make sense because they've been doing the longitudinal study for almost three years. So think about it that way. This group represents sort of uh, somewhat the older group. All right, um, and I've switched a little bit. These bars tell us in its percentages. So in this case, the green would be an increase in interest, the red is same interest, and a blue is a decrease in interest. So when you look at that, this is across the surveys now, so the initial and the three follow-ups, it appears that there's a decrease in interest. So it looks like as we go along, this group of bronies is actually losing interest. However, I would point out a couple things. If you look at the number, 70% at the follow-up three are still reporting either the same interest or more interest. So even though the, the uh, drop in interest uh, is greater, um, there's still an awful lot of them who are still very uh, sort of connected in that. Um, but it does look like there's a general decrease. Um, the initial conclusion, or I guess no, you're going to do okay. um, What are the initial conclusions from, from just that data? Is that in general, the small sample of bronies, the interest, interest declined, over the time period, 
However, as I mentioned, at follow-up three, the most recent, there was a slightly more than 75% who reported either staying the same or an increase. So it would appear that this group of older bronies are, have somewhat of a declining interest, but um, I don't know that we should become too alarmed because it's not like 60 or 70% of them are losing interest. Um, also, as I mentioned, these bronies look like the season one and two bronies. Now, again, I had mentioned this before, and we keep coming back to the brony types, because their importance is they give us an understanding. If all we did was collect the bronies' data, look at it, this would tend to say the bronies are losing interest. <coughs> However, what about the brony types? So when we go in and look at our types, what we see is that for the social bronies, there is, we see that slight decrease, but when you look at this, oh, almost 85% of the social bronies are either the same or gaining in interest. So the percentage who are actually losing interest are not, are not that high. They're a fairly small percentage. When we look at the secret bronies, what we see is that the secret bronies, there, there is somewhat uh, more of an increase, <coughs> only 70% are the same, or losing interest, or gaining interest, excuse me, at follow-up three. But notice the interesting thing here. What happened at follow-up two? This was season four, and for some reason, for the secret bronies, season four was particularly intriguing to them because, in fact, they gained interest after season four. So I'm not sure, we're not sure what to make of that. We may need to go in and ask bronies what happened in season four that might have caused the secret bronies to, to gain in, in interest. Then we, uh, was that when Princess Twilight became a princess? That was, uh, that was the end of three that she became a princess. Okay. No, so I haven't kept them all straight in my own head. Uh, the mixed bronies, again, we see the same pattern. So, but I would point out almost 80% of the mixed bronies, same interest or an increase. So even though we're seeing somewhat of a, a slot, uh, an, a, an increase in loss of interest, the sizable portion of even these older bronies, there's no difference. However, we got two more to go, the hipsters. Now we see where the hipster bronies are, we're almost up to 40% of them losing interest. Now also remember, this, this was the group that was the biggest early, but now make up a much smaller group. These are also, and I don't want to characterize the whole group, but these I think tend to be also what I would call your Rule 34 bronies, in that, and your 4chan bronies. These are the bronies who have often been around for a while. These are the ones I get in discussions about how much things have changed and how much you know they, they used to be. Uh, it used to have a lot of shock value. You know, now you might tell somebody I'm a brony, and they might, oh, cool, I have a cousin who's a brony. Wait, that wasn't the response I expected. You know, there, there isn't that shock value. But clearly the hipsters are losing interest, and the hidden even more so. So what we see here is when we, the, conclusion, the conclusions we take from this, the longitudinal analysis, is that in general there's a slight decline in interest over time. However, there's a noticeable difference that exists between the types of bronies uh, that the bronies, the secret, the social, and the mixed, who find more guidance and meaning and purpose, tend to not be losing interest in anywhere near the same level. I mean, we're talking 80 to 70, 80 percent, the same or, or stronger than that. Also, um, it's interesting that, that there's, there's Another possible explanation, though, because you look at this and say, between season three, or excuse me, season four and season five, it appears that a lot of these older bronies lost interest. However, I'm also reminded, as I was thinking about this, what's happened between season four and season five? Twelve months elapsed. There was a whole year between the end of four. There might be a message here for Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say maybe six to eight months and you're pushing it. 
you know, you can't expect fans to sit around for a year in anticipation of the next release. Now, maybe they thought uh, as Questria Girls in between, maybe would hold over, but I wonder if some of this spike in loss of interest, and we'll see when we do the postseason five, it'll be interesting to see if, in fact, interest perks back up in that. So let's talk about the overall conclusions. Uh, as we said in the first assumption, the fandom is changing. Uh, but those fans who are leaving are doing so because they no longer fit with the bronies that are in the community now, and that's mostly the hipsters and the hidden bronies with the newer crop of the secret social and uh, mixed bronies pretty much remaining the same. The second thing is that those uh, types of bronies that are losing interest represent are also a shrinking population within the fandom. So the, the, the groups that make up most, the, the largest percentage of the fandom are growing, but those which make up the smallest, uh, smallest group are, all, are those that are shrinking. And that's one of the reasons why we favor this brony typology is because it gives us some insight into how and why. Yeah. <clears throat> there are certain types that are, are, are going away and others that are increasing. So it takes away a little bit of the mystery. If you just look at a big group, you can't always tell if, you know, what patterns there are, but our typology helps with that. You know, Dr. Edwards and I have had the opportunity uh, to study this fandom since its beginning. And I don't think that, that many uh, social psychologists have had that opportunity, but we have been very, very fortunate and have been able to study this from the beginning. So we are ca able to say that the state of the herd right now, although it's in flux, as all groups are in flux, uh, can be viewed as a process of um, something that is becoming uh, new all the time and it is something which is maturing as all groups mature. So um, we have a few minutes oh, and yeah, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. yeah. We got um, one more thing. Also let me man before I go on to this last piece and I was mentioning somebody earlier, I I've taken now to always take a moment to, to thank the fandom, not just because you're you know, you've helped with our research. But I want to thank you for everyone. Because I really think the Brony fandom has uh, raised the potential to a lot of people about the use of the internet as a pro-social uh, place. You know, that the, the idea of, of groups that can come together and it can be safe and it can be supportive. And, that, and that's something you all are doing for all of us. And, and it I can be fun. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> One uh, last thing I wanted to do, I, I find it kind of interesting because when we first started doing this, in fact, I, I, I feel sort of proud about one of the things we were able to help the Bronies do early was to dispel some of the early myths and shut up Fox News. <laughs> there, there was a lot of negativity going, and, and I remember having gone to some of the early cons and then hearing people on news talk, and I'm like, were we at, were we at the same meetings? You know, it was like, one of the things that in 2012, an article came out by the Daily Dot that talked about the five signs of a fading fandom, and they were talking about the bronies. And I wanted to mention those five points because I, I want to mention how I think they are no longer relevant. The first point was they said there was a lot of bullying and drama. And, and I think early on, sometimes this who's the best pony stuff would get a little out of hand, you know, <laughs> the verbal fighting about it. Also, there was a lot of drama, and I can remember the derpy, the oh, derpy yeah. fiasco, oh, Twilight then, becoming a princess. And then when Equestria Girls Equestria came, girls out, came oh, out, oh, Lord. I'm the sky is you, falling. 
there was almost a just, just, I mean, we were about to pass out medication. But, but it was a lot of drama, and a lot of people were saying, oh, come on. But in fact, what I think has happened is as more of the, the, the social secret and mixed bronies have come in, they tend not to get caught up in that. They tend not to be as, you know, they'll argue on who's the best pony, but they, they're not going to say nasty, terrible things. They're not going to bully each other, and there was some of that taking place. The second thing is, uh, they argued that a lot of the big name fans were keeping their distance, that we were losing some of the early fans. Well, I think in some ways, again, those represented, some of them represented the 4chan bronies, and also they represented the hipsters. I hate to see anybody leave, but sometimes places no longer fit for you. Sometimes the members, you know, the fandom, it's like churches, people who start a church, Sometimes when the church grows and gets big, they look around and say, this isn't my church anymore. And I think that that happened with some of the early names in the Brony fandom. Now, the third point was media oversaturation. The thought at that point was there was a lot of attention from Fox, from Howard Stern, from other people. However, I would argue media attention's only a problem if it's negative. And my sense is in that in the recent year or two, the brony attention has been positive. You know, uh, I keep seeing, we get calls from people who want to interview us for newspaper articles and that, and it's always positive. Nobody's looking and digging for dirty stuff. And, and it's, it's the, the media is treating the brony fandom different. And so I think that's great. It's part of the advertisement, plus those two movies. Uh, I've had so many people come up, wait, I saw you on Netflix. Yeah, you, were on, you, were on Netflix. <laughs> you know, those have gone a long ways to introduce a lot of people to the fandom. Fewer newbies or new members. There was a point there where there was a little bit of flux, but I think, again, because of the movies coming out and because of the media beginning to go positive, my sense is, and I sat through Coder Brony's uh, report, is that new members are coming in. And again, they're social bronies, they're secret bronies, they're dedicated, and they're here because it's a safe, fun place to be. So I don't think that fits. And then they also talked about the loss of the founding values. And I'm like, and I kind of wrote here, who or what bronies were they talking to? Yeah. Because I don't see that in the fandom. I don't see it becoming a less safe place to be. I don't see a lot of negative drama in that. So, at that snapshot they took in 2012, these may have looked like valid points, but I, I personally don't feel like they fit uh, anymore. We were uh, wondering if the person that wrote this didn't interview some of the uh, hidden or hipster brownies rather yeah. than one from the other groups. Now, let me mention something real quick because I know we're just about out of time. And we'll try to take a couple questions, but if I can get my research ponies, where are you guys at? They have some slips of paper. If you have a question for us, tomorrow uh, evening at 6.30 in the big room, we'll be doing Ask the Brony Psychologist. If you want to take one of those slips, jot your question down on it and hand it back to them, we're going to look through it, so we'll bring those in tomorrow night, as well as we'll take questions that people have. So we're, we love your questions, and in fact, that whole hour will be devoted to nothing but answering the questions uh, that you have. But again, uh, we want to thank you all for uh, participating in our studies and for sitting here. And I guess, how much time do we have? We're going to 15. Oh, 15 Ooh, minutes. We oh, we did good. We covered faster than we thought. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do this then. If you want to write out a question, if you'll raise your hand, we'll get Scott or Will to come around and hand you a slip. Uh, otherwise, I guess maybe if there's anybody here in the, in the front. One of you have a question? You want to ask it, and we'll repeat it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that he, was, he asked that the, was Coda Brownie. Yeah, he asked the question about the Myers Briggs uh, personality types, and that was actually uh, the sent the herd census. Coder Brownies. 
And he noticed if you were here a little earlier, they changed that, which, um, which is good because the Myers-Briggs, while it's used a lot by a lot of people within psychology, it, it has no validity. Um, um, it's, it, for the, one thing, it's past its prime. It hasn't been re, renormed or re, uh, re, uh, redone in about 40 years. Also, the instruments they created way back, way back 40 years ago, often they didn't use the same reliability and validity we that didn't, we do we today. We didn't have the same computer, uh, computer availability to do the, to run the statistics that they've got now. If you go to the herd census, the 2014 data, they're using the new, the big five personality, which is also what we use, where you talk about introvert, extrovert, conscientiousness, neuroticism. And the instrument they're using now is one of the primo instruments. Yeah, so, it's a really good uh, instrument. It's really so, good in that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, one day, <laughs> one day, uh, Patrick and I were were uh, teaching part time at a small liberal arts college, and our offices were right next to each other. And one day, I was leaving, and he said, "Marsha, have you heard of the Bronies?" And I said, "The what?" <laughs> and he said, "The Bronies." And he explained what a brony was, and I said, "You gotta be kidding me." And uh, he said no, and we started think we started talking about it, and we started talking about what our different interests are in. And I was a practicing clinical psychologist, and so my interests were in personality, uh, what attracted people to certain things, and also developmental. And Patrick was interested in some other things, uh, in absorption, uh, concentration, and attention, things of that nature. And you know, we said this fandom's just getting started. We ought to study this. Somebody needs to study this, and that was how it started. I, I like to say we took the line from Twilight Sparkle. We must, we must science, science this, this. immediately. <laughs> you know? And so there started the study. In other words, yeah, the general question, you know, why do people like the show and what? Well, in some of our, and if you go to our the bronystudy.com, our results, we talk about some of what we found. We went in and looked at what people like about the show and also the fandom. And as you might expect, um, people like the characters. They like the personalities of the ponies. They like the artwork. They like the music. They also like the fact that, it, as one brony said, you know, there's nothing like 20 minutes of ponies after a, a hard day. You know, it lifts your spirits, it makes you smile. Um, and then with respect to the fandom, part of what they like is it's, a, it's something to share with their friends. It's a way of making new friends um, and, and that. So all of, those, all of those are important features. What you discover is for each fan, it's totally different. As I mentioned, the hidden bronies seem to primarily like the show, but they don't feel like they want to necessarily make friends with other bronies. They don't want to let people know they're a brony. Whereas the hipsters, at first, they liked telling you they were a brony. They liked the shock. They, and in fact, actually, let me also mention this. Some of the hipsters fit what I have sometimes termed the brony uh, trolls. And you might say, well, wait. I have a stepdaughter, and she's big into anime. And when I first told her that I was studying bronies, I won't repeat what she said about them. She said, every brony I've ever met is a blank to blank to blank. And I, and I went, I said, well, you're meeting the wrong group of bronies. But I think what was happening Show me your data. <laughs> But, but part of it was some of those early hipster bronies, part of what they liked is they liked to get a shock on people. And they liked to piss haters off. 
you know. And so they were going to these anime cons, pissing people off. And that was the perception that a lot of the uh, the anime people I was talking with, they had all oh, those bronies. They're a rotten, terrible lot. And I'm like, you're talking to the wrong. So, but again, they're getting something out of it. In this case, they're getting kind of the shock value. But they're also lessening. They're going away because, well, some ways the fandom isn't putting up with it. Some some fan groups of bronies say, no, we're not putting. We're kicking you out if you are trying to pick fights with the other members. That's not what we're about. You know, uh, Howard Stern called the Brownies the end of civilization. That's, that's a very good question. The question was, have we noticed that these types of bronies are changing? You know, in other words, can somebody be uh, a secret brony and then become a social brony? That's a real good question, and we're going to be able to start looking at that now with the longitudinal data. Um, my suspicion is that, in general, I think it's going to be fairly stable. I think if you have an, an interest in guidance and direction, that's not going to go away. But I do think what may happen, and it may fit in here, because I've had, we've had secret bronies who will finally take the risk. And in fact, I had one a couple years ago who was a secret brony. He was also um, in ROTC. He was an engineering student at a large university. And he said, Dr. Edwards, I don't know any other bronies. Because he was so secret, couldn't tell his parents. His father would never have accepted it. Um, and I said, well, why don't you ask somebody in the engineering department? Just take the risk. He called me back two days later and said, you're not going to believe this. Everybody in the engineering honors college is a brony. Yeah. And so he, he was still secret with his family, but he began to sort of. So I think if, I, if there's anything, I suspect some of these, the, the people who aren't disclosing may move to being a little more open about it. But it's also okay if someone wants to be a secret brony. I mean, you don't have to let everybody know. You know? And, and for some people, it's just not, not advantageous, you know, uh, because of their job or because of their, their, uh, their family and their family's organization. Uh, it's just not that, you know, if you've got a very stern, two very stern parents, it may not be in your best interest to let them know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, and I think, to, and we, in, in our book, we're going to address all of these things in a little more detail. And I think one thing that is happening <coughs> is there are some bronies who are, and I had one person say, they're outgrowing the fandom. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know if that's the best way to put it. But I'm often reminded when I go to meetups, and I sometimes, bronies will say, well, why do, you, why do people stop? coming to the meetups or that. And I'll ask, and I'll say, well, what do you think? And always there's one thing people say. They got girlfriends. <laughs> and I think it speaks to, not all of them, but, <laughs> but it speaks to the fact that sometimes, you know, people's life goes, you know, you're, you're not 19 anymore. You're 23. You have a full-time job. You have, um, and in fact, I was talking with someone to use the analogy. My son was a, a Boy Scout. He was an Eagle Scout. Uh, and you know, they have their sash with all their merit badges. And for some people, being a brony is like a very important merit badge. It's, it's an important part of who they are. It will forever be a part of who they are. But they're adding other badges. And so for some people, and in fact, I've had people say, listen, I don't watch anymore. And I don't really interact much with other, but I'm still a brony. And I think that that's one thing we're likely to see is people will move on, but I think they, most of them will always have that place.
for the ponies. And they'll realize this is an important part of who I was. And some people will continue with it on forever, you know, and that. So, so, and that's a part of the maturing. Some maturing is some people will leave the fandom, but they're not leaving because they're upset and angry. They're not leaving, uh, they're leaving because well, life, goes life, on. life goes on. You know? And in fact, some of them, I wouldn't be surprised if when they get married and have kids, guess what? They're going to bring their kids to the fandom. You know, I think that that's what's good. Okay. Well, listen, I think um, we're getting signaled that maybe we take one more. If you have a question, hold your hand up. And guys, if you can pass out what happened to Scott and Will. If you can pass out the slips to any of these other people with questions in that. But let's take you right there. Our, the, the fandom by and large, and Coder Bronies looked the same way in the census uh, that he was showing today. Um, about 75% from North America, and then you know maybe about 18% from Europe, and that we for the book we're going to go in and look at that. But in honesty, we haven't gone in and, and teased them out yet. But we're going to do that more for the book. Uh, although there are some things that, and, and Marcia can speak to. <laughs> that um, I think there is growth that's going to happen within the fandom, but one possibility is it's going to come from these other areas. We've had a Chinese brony contact us, and they report an extremely large growth in interest in the My Little Pony in China. I mean, the rate of like 40,000 people a day visiting some sites. So it's possible we might see a big growth in some of these other, the fandoms in these other, but we are going to mention that, but we, don't, we haven't seen anything that would tell us there's a drastic big difference, you know. And you know, another, one of the other problems with, um, with assessing the international population is the language barrier. Um, <clears throat> I don't speak anything but English. I don't think you do either. Sometimes I think that's a second language. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, we've, I do know for a fact that uh, our first, very first uh, survey was translated into Russian. But they did not send us the data. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the other thing is that when you translate some of these things, uh, the nuances of the language may not translate. And so it, it, that's going to be, a, that's an issue, a whole different issue in itself. And we have a Hungarian brony who claims to have 5,000 surveys. Yes. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk with them and try to get some access. And that. And again, I think uh, we'd like to thank you all. Again, tomorrow at 6.30, we'll have the Ask the Brony Psychologist. So we'll be in the room next door. Thank you all. And please take our survey. If you would like your photo if you would like your photo taken possibly to be in the book and are willing to sign a release and you're over at your 18 years of old or older and can show me a driver's license uh, please meet me over there <laughs>